kind of reverse the order of the agenda um, through force of circumstance. Um, and so um, this may actually turn out to be uh, appropriate, really, because in terms of the history of what happened, George Lukács, who was a Hungarian revolutionary, actually wrote a whole series of... He wrote his key revolutionary works in the uh, uh, early 1920s, and they were mainly an attempt to explain and sort of develop the theoretical principles that he uh, believed lay behind what Lenin and the Bolsheviks had done in the Russian Revolution. So it was, in a way, he was kind of theorising the experience of the 1917 revolution and a, a whole other, a whole series of other revolutionary moments that um, came out of uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917. So maybe this will work because we're kind of following the historical logic. Hopefully it will, anyway. And obviously, what I want to do is to um, to kind of exp to kind of broaden out and develop on the, the discussion that we had um, in, the, in, the, in the first session. Um, um, I want to start with two quotes from Marx uh, that, that Lukács mentions. Uh, and the first is from the German ideology. Marx said that the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas, i.e. the class which is the ruling material, <coughs> the class which is the ruling material force in society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. That's quote one. Quote two, also from Marx, the emancipation of the working class must be the act of the working class itself. Now, if you think about it, those two quotes at least partially contradict each other. Um, uh, uh, because, you know, obviously, if the ruling class dominate in terms of ideas, then how can the working class emancipate itself? And in a way, uh, I think what George Lukács does, if you can summarise what is a kind of quite a immense and, and sometimes a bit intimidating body of work. What he does is to explain that paradox, that contradiction, better than any other um, socialist, Marxist uh, uh, has done at any time. And Lukács' point was that in the way that you deal with this problem, this is actually a problem if you think about it, anyone who's, whether they're a Marxist or not, anyone who's seriously involved in sort of radical politics or wants to change the world, they do have to grapple with this. How do you deal with ruling class ideas? Where do alternative ideas come from? And Lukács' point was that the way that you answer that question is not just an academic matter. It's not just a kind of, you know, a matter of no importance. It actually determines almost everything you do. It determines your strategy. It determines your whole political outlook and political project. Um, for, I'll just give you a couple of examples, just, you know, in a way off the top of my head thinking about it. One, one is the, the 1980s, when um, a lot of people here thankfully won't remember, um, but there was a big argument, there was a big feeling on the left, particularly the left in the Labour Party, but the wider left in the 1980s, that the media was completely dominating the way people thought about the world. There was this idea that the sun was all powerful and that Murdoch, the Murdoch press and that basically people believed everything they read in the, in the bourgeois media. And that, that actually had an effect on what the left did, because in those circumstances, the left kind of gave in to the argument from the Labour Party leadership at the time, Neil Kinnock it was at the time, who said, we've got to take the Labour Party to the right, because if we don't, we'll get attacked by the sun, and the sun will destroy everything. So, and, and to a certain, I mean, I'm not saying there wasn't an argument, of course there was an argument in the Labour Party and so forth, but nevertheless, this idea that ruling class ideas dominate completely does actually determine what you you know, how you operate as a, as a, as a socialist. The, on the other hand, there's the opposite extreme, which is the idea that, uh, and Elaine mentioned it, Elaine referred to it, it's the idea that the experience of capitalism itself at some point will automatically lead to people having revolutionary consciousness and somehow a revolutionary movement will just emerge out of just the bitterness and... And, and, and anger that people feel on an everyday basis from being exploited, from being oppressed, and so on and so forth. Now, put like that, it sounds balmy, but actually, that is quite, I think that is actually quite an influential set of ideas at the moment, and certainly some of the leading people in the anti capitalist movement. I noticed someone today, I can't remember who it was, I've got a book by John Holloway that's quite a popular book at the moment. I think it's called, is it called Crack Crack, 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 crack Capitalism? So I need to get that right. Um, uh, John Holloway is someone, he's an autonomist, is what they call. But he basically does believe that. He believes that, and, and the people that he influences, he's quite an influential figure amongst people um, 
in the anti-capitalist movement and so forth, that basically, you know, just being under capitalism at some point will lead people to revolt and to smash the system. And actually, there's some... I mean, I, I, I think this, this attitude, in a slightly different way, has come to dominate sections of the, of the Marxist left in Britain and no doubt elsewhere, which, where, where, where people take a kind of... Uh, they kind of observe from the sidelines because they believe that at some stage the proletariat is going to come marching over the hill, declare a general strike, that will then lead to, you know, a social crisis and... <coughs> things will happen, and that, therefore what we need to do is to maybe prepare technically for the revolution, <coughs> and maybe preach a bit of revolution as well, and inculcate people with our ideas, but essentially we can do that from the sidelines, and the, the process will unfold. And it's, and it's what's called, um, this theory, this idea that, that, that that's how things are going to happen, is called spontaneism, you know, the idea of spontaneous, um, spontaneous revolt. But what it leads to, funnily enough, is passivity. What it leads to is what Lukács calls tailism. Because, you know, if you think things are going to happen, then really you just sit in your hands and wait for it, essentially. Um, and it was, it was this idea of, uh, of, of, of spontaneism, it was this tailism that, uh, that Lukács was fighting against, mostly in terms of the, the work that he wrote, because it, was, it dominated, or no, it, it had dominated the socialist movement before the Russian Revolution, and in the shape of Stalinism, it was a kind of fatalism about how things are going to unfold, about socialism inevitably developing out of the contradictions of capitalism, was coming back. And so what Lukács' work in the 1920s is more than anything is an attack on fatalism, an attack on this idea that things are going to inevitably move in the right direction. Now, so, so he, he takes this on by by trying to work out how consciousness is shaped under capitalism. Most radical theories about how, uh, about how capitalism survives and how it, it secures consent from the population centre on uh, the issues around ideology. <coughs> in the sense that, you know, coming back to what I said earlier, in the sense there's a concentration on the media, on education, on religion, on academia, on the kind of the superstructure of society, what Marx called the superstructure, that you know, ideas are generated by the capitalists that then dominate um, people's minds. There's a, I mean, this theory is and it's most clearest in the, in the shape of one Noam Chomsky that people probably know about. And he has a, a theory of the media, which is called the propaganda model. And he basically argues that the media is the reason why people don't fight back. Now... Um, the, you know, this theory, obviously there's a, there's a strong element of truth in this theory, but the problem with it is it can, it can explain why people consent a lot of the time to capitalism. But what it can't explain is why people ever do fight back, because they do. Uh, and that's the problem with the propaganda model, and it's a very serious problem. And George Lukács, when he was trying to explain how ideas are shaped, he took into account, obviously, the superstructure, the media and all of these things. But his, uh, his starting point was actually uh, a, a, an examination of the structure of capitalism <coughs> itself, how capitalism work, works in a more uh, fundamental way. And what he argued is that capitalism is unique in that it's created what he called a unified structure of consciousness. And this is based on um, the fact that under capitalism everything is turned into a commodity. There's a set of ideas he took from Marx, from, from uh, Marx's book, about uh, Das Kapital. And what he argued was that commodity production shapes everything under society, in, in, in capitalist society. It actually shapes uh, how, not just how we think about the world, but how we experience the world. Because uh, the fact that everything uh, is, is uh, reduced to a commodity under capitalism, a commodity is just a unit of product that is produced uh, in order to create a, 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 to create a profit for the capitalist. The fact that everything is bought and sold um, hides the fundamental relations of capitalist society. It kind of tends to hide the fact that, that capitalism is a class society and that it's based on uh, exploitations, uh, exploitation. The commodification of society includes human beings. Human beings are commodified in the sense that well, certainly our labour power is commodified. When we go to work, we sell our labour power to the boss. And that process of selling our labour power to the boss appears on the surface to be, you know, a fair exchange. You 
you get a job, there's a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, and that's okay. And, and, and that relationship kind of hides the fact that what, re- what is really going on is robbery. And um, so commodity production has the effect of, uh, uh, of kind of uh, covering up the real relations of society and giving the relations between people the appearance of being relations uh, between things. And so everything is what uh, George Lucas called uh, reified, turned into things. Everything is actually turned into a thing and, and taken out of the real process and the real relations of society. So, as I say, this experience isn't, it isn't just limited to the kind of marketplace. It isn't just limited to, to buying and selling on the high street or online or whatever. Uh, it, it reaches into the workplace. And uh, hum, when you go to work, you're actually... You experience work as, as you're kind of a, a component of the production process. As he says, a worker is a mechanical part incorporated into a mechanical system. He finds it, he says he, finds it pre-existing and self-sufficient. It functions independently of him and he has to conform to its, to its laws whether he likes it or not. And so when you go to work, this, this kind of process appears to be completely you know, it appears to be kind of natural, God-given. It, it happened before you were born, it carries on after you die, and there's nothing you can do about it. And such a kind of experiences of life are not, they're not just uh, about the marketplace, they're not just about um, kind of <coughs> pure capitalist workplace conditions when you work for a big company. They actually kind of suffuse every element of society, whether it's the public services, whether it's... Uh, academic institutions, education, the media, even the way the news is presented. Everything is separated off, everything is um, uh, fragmented, everything is taken out of the process to which it belongs. And so you get, for example, when you, when you watch the news, you get different aspects of capitalist society. They, in reality, are completely connected. You know, unemployment, a crash in the stock market, a, a war, all these things are connected. But they're, but they're seen completely discreet, they're presented completely discreetly. And this way of thinking of things in separation, fragmented, dominates all, uh, uh, the whole of our society. And this is what he meant by um, a unified structure of consciousness. Now, um, uh, just sorry, just one last quote actually, but just to give an idea of the kind of impact that this has on us. Um, what Lukács says is that these kind of processes dominate our state of mind to such an extent that the personality can do no more than look on helplessly while its own existence is reduced to an isolated particle in an alien system. I don't know if that rings any bells, but I mean that is a kind of summation of, of what he felt was the experience of living under capitalism and how it disempowers you and makes you feel atomised and separate and out of any kind of real historical process, which is in reality going on kind of behind the scenes, behind your back. So this unified structure of consciousness, which is, which is part of the system, which is rooted in the way capitalism works, is obviously very good news for the bosses. It's very good news for the capitalists because it stops us joining the dots. It stops us understanding the deeper processes that are going on, the deeper processes of robbery and exploitation. There is, however, luckily for the capitalists, a big catch. And that catch is that although uh, as human beings we are, in a sense, turned into commodities, or at least our labour power, when we sell it on the market, is, is, is turned into a commodity. Um, labour power is a very special commodity. It's a unique commodity because it is actually attached to a brain uh, in a way that no other commodity is. And because it's attached to a brain, it, it can become self-conscious and it can become aware of the way that it is being treated. And um, this, is a, this, this for Lukács was the kind of secret to where resistance can come from. Because uh, the process of commodification, based as it is on competition and the, the mad dash for profits by the capitalists, all, all, at almost all times leads to a situation where the bosses are trying to cut your lunch break, extend your working day, reduce your wages, reduce the perks, constantly trying to do you over. We all know this from experience. And, you know, that's a bit of a problem for the boss because they're doing this to a commodity that can think for itself and that has the ability to to become self-conscious of how it's being um, treated. So, the fact that, uh, and, and so, you know, 
because, you know, obviously at various different stages workers fight back to various different degrees. They resist the attempt to, make the work, to get rid of a lunch break or, or whatever it might be. And this resistance creates, first of all, a limit to accumulation. It, it creates the possibility of the boss's profits being reduced because, you know, we can't make the workers work any longer. Look at BA, for example, they're trying to squeeze more out of their workers and that the workers are fighting back to stop it. So it, it creates a potential limit to accumulation, to the, to the accumulation of profits, but it also, in certain circumstances, creates the possibility of resistance and limits to commodification itself. Because when, when there are strikes, when people do start to take action um, against the bosses squeezing them, this throws open the whole, uh, this can throw open the whole process. Um, and in that process, people can begin to understand the real relations that lie behind commodification. Uh, and so cr class struggle and, and strikes and so forth, they are important in themselves, obviously, because they can lead to you getting better conditions. But in a way, more importantly, if they're militant and successful or, or if they you know, involve lots of people, they can open up all sorts of other questions in people's minds. And they do this all the time, actually. Even, it's very interesting, even the smallest strike. I mean, just to give you an example, in terms of overcoming divisions amongst workers, you know, when people go on strike, the, the, the unity is, is strength idea actually is very powerful at getting overcoming sexism or racism in the workforce because you know for obvious reasons you have to stand together otherwise you get defeated that's just one example another thing that always strikes me is that almost always when people go on strike they start to hate the media and they start to realize if they didn't already and most people actually nowadays already do but they start to realize the extent to which the media is dominated you know is pro boss is pro capitalist is right wing and you find people you know, time after time, people on the strike, they used to read the sun, they don't, they throw it away, I'm never reading that again because it attacked us when we were on strike. And so, just that process of resisting starts to open up the situation. And um, I'll just read a, uh, a quick quote from, from Marx about this very, very, very question of the strike and what, and what it does. Because he says here, um, he, sorry, he says that the class struggle uh, creates an ideological crisis for capitalism because there is here an antimony, that's like an opposition, right against right, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchanges, and between equal rights, force decides. So basically what he's saying is that suddenly this, this whole thing about we're all equal under capitalism breaks down because the boss is saying, I've got the right to make you work harder, and the, wor the, the worker is saying, I've got the right to higher wages. Now, in, in terms of human rights or equal rights theory, you can't decide between them. And as Marx says, in those circumstances, force decides. So in other words, people suddenly realise, hang on a minute, you know, this commodification is hiding other things. It's hiding relations of exploitation. It's hiding uh, antagonisms. And in, in, in Lukács' um, phrase, this is the point at, at which the eternal laws of capitalist... Sorry, the eternal laws of capitalism fail and become dialectical and are thus compelled to yield up the decisions regarding the fate of history to the conscious actions of men. In other words, you know, people suddenly realise, well, actually, being passive is no good. Fighting back can get you somewhere. And, and we really do need to get together and, and start to resist because it can get results and it's the only way forward. And, that, uh, 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 and so it's, it can be a massive sort of um, transforming uh, experience for people and obviously when strikes take on a, a national character, when there are mass strikes, when they get in you know, various times when other people get involved in support, they become like the minor strike in the 80s in Britain, they kind of open up a huge social crisis around which all sorts of ideas develop in a, in a very, very big way. And so just to summarise this, the, the, this, the first part, the, the structure of capitalism itself, according to Lukács, creates both passivity most of the time and at certain moments it creates mass resistance and the beginning of a real understanding of how the system works. And one thing I'd like to just throw in here is that, you know, these kind of crises that come out of strikes or, or mass resistance on this kind of scale, they can happen very suddenly. And actually, by and large, they do historically happen very suddenly. Both the 1905 revolution and the February 1917 revolution took everyone by surprise in Russia. And this is true, you know, there's been plenty of other examples of where there's been these huge so social crises that erupt 
very, very suddenly. And, and one of the lessons I think that's important from that is that, you know, there were dark days in Russia in 1909, 1910, that period after the defeat of the first revolution. But the fact that Lenin and the Bolsheviks held together a revolutionary organisation, even though it was really difficult, was, was, was of immense importance later because they were in a situation where when they got suddenly there was a new revolutionary period, 1917 to... Sorry, the, the, the two revolutions in 1917. There was actually a group of people that were saying, we've got to, uh, to, 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 to um, uh, you know, we, we can take the revolution forward. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the, the kind of framework. The, the, the other main point I want to make is this, is that there is a huge qualification to the, particularly the second part of what Lukács argued, the, the, the way that resistance develops. Uh, a massive con uh, 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 qualification, which in a way is the main kind of importance of what he, uh, of what he set about arguing. And this qualification revolves around a couple of things. The first is that the struggles that the system throws up, whether they're strikes or mass movements or whatever they might be, um, however big they are, the, the spontaneous strikes that are thrown up, they are always partial, they are always sectional, they were always uneven. You know, it's, I mean, as Lane said it earlier, it's not the case that workers in, across one particular country all wake up in the morning and say, right, today we definitely have to have a general strike. The general strike will be a culmination of a whole series of other things going on. Um, <coughs> and it will affect, you know, they'll affect different people to different degrees. It's not the case that even if you have a general strike, it's not the case that overnight all workers suddenly think, oh, we had a general strike, that was good, now we need a revolution. There'll be a section, there'll be an unevenness about the experience. Some workers will have been hit harder, some workers will be young, some workers will be you know, in better conditions than others. And so inevitably, even in the deepest social crisis, there will be a huge level of une unevenness about what people are thinking about how to go forward. And the second point of the qualification is it co completely connected, but the, um, the old ways of thinking, the kind of passive ways of thinking, that exist under capitalism don't disappear overnight, even in the best of circumstances. And partly they don't because of the unevenness, and partly they don't because capitalist institutions are, you know, are designed to, uh, partly consciously, but anyway, they, they do reinforce division, they reinforce passivity, they reinforce the idea that politics and economics are separate. Uh, and, and those, you know, when you have a general strike, those institutions don't just crumble. The media is still pumping out its rubbish. It will change its arguments. It will try and accommodate to some of the demands and so on and so forth. But it will still be trying to exploit the divisions. It will still be trying to confuse people. The, the social democratic leaders, the reformist leaders who've been saying, you know, whatever they've been saying for, for ages, they'll, they'll move to the left, but they'll still, still say, look, it's great what you've done. You've gone on strike. Now go back to work and we'll sort out everything for you. And, 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 and so the, the, the massive structure, this is where the superstructure does come into play. They re, the, 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 the superstructure reinforces all these kinds of uh, ways of thinking. So the result is that, as I say, even in periods of absolutely intense social crisis, mass class struggle, virtual breakdown of the capitalist system that sometimes can happen spontaneously, even in those circumstances, there'll still be... What, what revolutionary periods are characterised by more than anything else in... in in the modern world is argument and debate and different points of view. And actually, it's not the case, in case anyone thinks it, it's not the case that the 20th century or the last you know, number of decades haven't been marked by revolutionary <coughs> moments. Right throughout the 20th century, there are all sorts of moments where revolution seemed to be on the cards. I mean, famously, May 68 in France, and then coming out of May 68, there was a revolution in Portugal in 1974, there was revolutionary movement, there was a semi-revolutionary crisis in Italy in 1969, um, Poland in 1981, you could go on. There are all sorts of moments where the system appears to be on the brink of collapse. And actually, if you look at these moments, it's very interesting. It's not normally mainly mass force, you know, the use of the army or the security services or whatever that have crushed the movements, although that is more or less important in different cases. It's normally the kind of political institutions have cut, talked people down and have confused the movement and have managed to disorientate the movement. Like May 68 is a case in point. I mean, for all the revolutionary excitement, in the end of the day, it kind of petered out. 
you know, essentially. And, and one of the things, and they, you know, they brought in, the, it was Mitterrand actually, was brought in as a kind of left face of the, of the system, who did say, you know, that, oh, you, it's getting a bit out of hand, you know, the bins aren't being collected, blah, 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 go back to work. He did say, you know, we'll have an election, promise. And that's why, and actually the right wing won that election, funnily enough. So, um, so this is normally how revolutionary, revolutionary situations are contained. And, I mean, you know, uh, obviously the conclusion kind of reinforces what we were saying in the, in the first session. The conclusion from all of this is that, that for these reasons, for all these reasons, it is absolutely crucial that those people who, in the process of struggling, have reached the conclusion that we need to change the system, we need to have a revolution, those people can't just hang around on their own. Those people, as early as possible in this situation, need to get together and, and form an organisation, a network together, in order to be able to have an argument in wider society, just like the Mitterrands and the, and the, and the reformists do. Because it is a, a revolution is a battle of ideas more than, uh, more than anything. Um, so, sorry, I'm just going to end on, on uh, one, two last comments. One of the, one of the comments is that... Um, one of the arguments against Lukács, one of the one of the sort of criticisms of him, is that uh, that really it's a bit problematic to say there's such a thing as correct class consciousness, which is essentially what he is saying because he's saying if there's unevenness, then those people who are arguing a particular uh, a, a line actually have an understanding of how to go forward. And it seems to me that um, it always seems strange actually an attack on the idea of of correct class consciousness because it seems that in fact any argument inside the movement whether it's in any attempt to persuade people to do something, whether it's not to cross a picket line, or whether it's students to go into occupation, any argument that you have in the movement actually has behind it the assumption that there is a correct way to move forward. And all Lukács is doing, and all Lenin was doing, was kind of systematising that, and saying those of us who believe that we have to transform society, not, uh, uh, we're not, you know, we, we're drawing this conclusion from the struggle itself, but we are coming together in order to systematically argue and try and develop, first of all, and then argue a way forward uh, for the movement. And um, uh, really, that is, the, that is the nub of what a revolutionary or, or organisation um, is, 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 all about, is all about. And the, the very last point is this, that, and it brings me back to the question of subjectivity and... Um, and, um, and objectivity, because what, and, and it refers very sort of centrally to the discussion we had before, because Lenin, uh, sorry, Lukács wrote a book about Lenin, one of the three main works that he wrote in this book in the 20s was a very good book on the, it's called the Unity of Le Lenin, the Unity of His Thought, and what Lukács argues in that is that, um, is that Lenin was breaking from any previous socialist idea of, of the nature of organisation. And particularly he was breaking from the idea that socialist organisation should be about, as I said before, about this idea of kind of technically preparing the revolution on the one hand, and on the other hand preaching um, socialism on the other. For, for Lenin, um, socialist organisation was actually about concrete leadership in the movement. It, it, it involved being separate and having your own debates and arguments within your organisation, but it involved more than anything um, uh, leadership within the movement. Because the problem with standing back from the situation and, and, and kind of essentially thinking that people are going to come towards you at some particular stage is that it suggests that uh, revolutionary consciousness will develop on a mass scale independently of any uh, intervention and that there's a kind of separation between the objective here and the subjective there. The whole core of both Lenin and Lukács is that the subjective and the objective are intertwined, are, are constantly interacting, and that actually things that the left does or, do, or, or doesn't do in certain circumstances, which are subjective questions, whether we build an anti-war movement, whether we try and build a mass movement against uh, of resistance against the recession. These are subjective questions. These are the things that we can decide to do or not to do. But when they're done or not done, they then become objective facts. And uh, just to, to, to read his quote on this, the subjective moment reaches in this moment, it's a moment of importance, its comprehensive significance precisely because and in as much as it has acted consciously and, active, and actively during earlier developments. In other words, 
one of the things that the, the, a revolutionary organisation does is it's part of developing revolutionary consciousness through the process, not just of talking to people, not just of selling papers, but actually actively leading the movements. There's just a few specific questions and then um, and, and a general point at the end. Uh, on a couple of questions about Lukács, one, one, why is he not as well known as some of the um, leading kind of Marxist figures from history? I mean, I guess there's a couple of reasons. One is that um, his revolutionary period really only spanned about eight or nine years. Uh, sorry, but, uh, but, uh, well, it depends how you put it exactly, but no, actually it was longer than that, so ten years probably. And he did, in a certain sense, without getting into controversy, he did capitulate to Stalinism, in, 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 not, in a, not in a very direct or particularly personally compromising way, but in terms of his ideas. And so that means that his later work is much less relevant. His work from the end of the after the end of the 1920s is much less relevant for this kind of discussion. I think that's one reason. But the, the other reason is a more positive one, um, is that, I mean, I think it's a bit like the relationship in academia and the wider world uh, between Marx and Lenin, is that Marx is kind of, it's acceptable in academic and educational talks, courses to talk about Marx as someone who described the system and maybe explained elements of it in an interesting way. Uh, but it's not acceptable to talk about Lenin. I mean, Lenin is, you know, I mean, there's lots of caricatures of Lenin that are used to attack him, but he's not, you don't get courses in university on Lenin and revolutionary theory, or by and large, someone can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that's probably the case. And I think it's the same with Lukács. I mean, his ideas are just indigestible for the, the kind of bourgeois establishment. I mean, there's nothing that someone who supports the system can say apart from try and attack them and, you know, take them on, and they don't... So, so I think that's the reason, mainly, that he's been, he's, he's been suppressed precisely because his ideas are so subversive. And indeed, he was, his earlier ideas were suppressed by the Stalinists themselves for similar reasons. Um, the, just the thing about Foucault and kind of postmodernism and stuff, I and mean, I agree exactly with, 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 with what uh, uh, Ellie was saying. I mean, the, the problem with Foucault and many of the people that followed Foucault is that although they talk about power... And they talk about relations of power. They, they, they lose sight of the, the concrete material basis of where power relations come from. They lose sight of kind of exploitation. They de-link power from the real world, actually, the real economic processes of the world. And because they do that, their explanations become completely vague. And basically, power lies everywhere for Foucault. It lies in language. It can lie in, a, um, in an argument between a partners over breakfast. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's power, it's, and, and therefore it's completely incomprehensible, um, which is bad in itself. But most importantly, it's, um, it's not just incomprehensible, but there's no way of understanding how it can be opposed. Because if it, once you de-link it from the economic uh, uh, process, from the, the kind of structures of capitalism, you lose sight of the, of the other side of Lukács, which is the side where he says that the commodity can, can unravel and resistance can explode. So, so it's a very depressing reading in the end. Because power is everywhere and power is all powerful. Um, just on, on Chomsky, I mean, I agree with uh, with with what people said um, with what people said about, uh, about Chomsky. I mean, part part of the reason why he's become so popular in the anti-capitalist movement, I think, is and they are sort of semi-anarchist or liberal, left liberal anarchist ideas. I mean, I agree with everything. By the way, I mean, obviously, Chomsky is a very, very important figure and a very, very influential. And the fact that his anti-imperialist analysis has got, is so popular internationally tells you something about the world, something good about the world. But nevertheless, the fact that that particular version of a kind of left liberal anti-imperialism dominates, I think it's partly because at the time of the, the emergence of the anti-capitalist movement, the left was in crisis and didn't kind of step up to the mark, you know, and wasn't able to provide the analysis that, that um, he, could, uh, he, he could provide. And partly as well, because these kind of essentially sort of spontaneous ideas, this kind of waiting for something to happen type approach, I mean, it is itself a product of capitalism in a certain way. And this is something Lukács talks about a lot, <coughs> how the left is always in danger of being reappropriated and being sucked back into the kind of you know, the, the passivity that, that is generated at every level by capitalism and, and to, to fall into a kind of contemplative, in other words, observing attitude to reality um, uh, 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 and just watching things and commenting on them, you know, and, and I think you see that time after time and I think this is, unfortunately, I think this is one of the keys, the secrets to, to, the, to the crisis that the left finds itself. We've had a period of defeats and that's been very, very important, but the, one of the outcomes of that is that, is that you know, Commodification is kind of, or, or 
the sort of reification has invaded the left, and we think that doing what we did in the 1960s or 1970s, same thing with copy of whatever paper we're selling and so forth, and hoping people come read it, just is what you do. You know, we become kind of formalistic and routinized, and and therefore uh, pass by um, by the kind of historical process. And I think um, you know, so we're not immune. The left isn't immune from the very processes of commodification that that um, that, uh, that 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 Lukács talked about. Um, uh, two last points. One is, so you were mentioning that a problem, apparently, for the theory is that commodification has spread to such an extent and that our whole world is, um, has been so dominated and invaded by the commodity form. You see, I mean, obviously that is a problem in a, in a, in a, in a certain sense. It's horrible. It's, it creates misery. It creates chaos and carnage around the world. But I don't think it's certainly not a problem for, for Lukács' theory because this is exactly what both he and Marx predicted. And moreover, what it does mean is that when there is a, a kind of rebellion against commodification in any particular sector of society or industry, you know, there's plenty of, there's plenty of kind of um, uh, uh, potential for it to spread very, very quickly. Because everyone, almost everyone in society who's not part of the ruling class or the upper middle classes knows what commodification feels like. You know, and one of the things that's happened, as people know, is lots of jobs that used to be called middle class or lots of jobs that used to be called petty bourgeois or whatever are now kind of suffering from the same, from the same processes. And therefore, a rebellion against commodification is liable to catch fire much, much quicker. So I think it proves exactly the opposite of what you were saying. It actually proves that, that you know, it proves the theory is right, actually, but it also proves that the possibility of the regeneration of the left on a very, very in a very, very short order, is actually on the cards. And it seems to me, whatever criticisms we do have, and I have quite a few, of the anti-capitalist movement, you know, I'm, by which I mean the movement that came out of Seattle and Genoa and, and, the, and the social forums and everything, whatever criticisms we may have of that movement and the things that have gone wrong in it, nevertheless, it is in itself testimony to the extent to which the current conjuncture can produce massive explosions of radicalisation. And I think the problem really... If you want to, as, a, as, as in lots of us keep saying, if you want to put your finger on the main problem, I'm not saying there aren't others, but the main problem that the left has faced over the last decade, it's been missing that which has been going on under its nose. Yeah. You know, yeah. thousands and thousands of people marching against the IMF trying to tear down the gates of the G8. You know, hey, wake up, people. Something's happening here. You know, I mean, I just think that is the, 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 that is the essential problem. Now, very final point, obviously... That doesn't solve the problem of, you know, the working class and working class resistance and so on. But I, but I think we, we don't, we mustn't fall into the reenactment society type approach of thinking that, you know, what's going to happen is it's going to be accumulation of small strikes that gradually build up and link together and, you know, so on and so forth. Actually, in a way, we are in danger again of looking a gift horse in the mouth because one of, one of the arguments that... Um, that Lukács puts is that, is that, you know, and Marx actually, is that I individual strikes are very, very important. They change the way people think about the world to a certain extent and so on and so forth. But they remain at the level of sectional. They remain marked by being fragmented and partial. And I think what we have before us is, it it's true these movements aren't socialist movements, not explicitly socialist movements, but they are movements, actually, if you think about them, that tend to address big questions that are part of the kind of totality. I mean, it's a strange situation. I'm not surprised people haven't woken up to it. You know, no one woke up to it immediately. But, you know, when you say 20,000 people marching against the Israeli embassy, it's very different from a strike. Well, that's true, but the question is different in what, what ways. And one way it's different in is that it is, it is actually challenging a kind of big, central... Uh, issue of world capitalism, i.e. imperialism, which is, you know, the, the Zionist state, which is back to the hilt by the US in order to control oil in the Middle East, in order to keep the, the system going. Now, you know, that's a big set of ideas, and when the people who go on those demos, they know those ideas, you listen to the speeches, people talk about oil, they talk about imperialism. Now, uh, it seems to me the job is for us not to be downhearted by the lack of strikes and so on and so forth. They will, they will happen and we should do everything we can to make them happen. But the key thing is, I think, and this is a discussion that will go on, we have these movements that are actually movements that have a tendency to join the dots. And that's a good thing. And I think what we need to do is to be as much part of those movements as possible, developing the movements, developing this process of generalisation that is already going on in these movements, 
and adding an element to them, which is arguing both within them and in practice making it happen, for, you know, uniting them with the idea of working class struggle over time. And that seems to me to be the project. And actually, it's not the 35 or 40 people in this room or the other whatever number of people in counter or other groups on the left who will do, who have to do that on our own. We actually do have a movement of a serious size that involves tens of thousands of people that can help us do that. And I think we have to, we have to actually, funnily enough, our job is to kind of unite the political and the economic but from the point of view of a, move, a very radical political movement that already exists, we need to make that movement have an influence on how workers respond to the growing economic crisis.